Good afternoon, everybody. Someone suggested I start with a joke, but I don't think I'm going to manage it. Um, I'll probably just bombard you with a lot of depressing statistics. Someone said um, that we're living in strange times. Was it you, Catherine? Yes. I think it was. I think we live in quite a strange place as well. And I'm not just talking about Leeds. I'm talking about the UK as a whole. Do you think we actually like children? <laughs> we all probably do. But I'm not sure that culturally we do enough or not enough to actually make sure that we enact the kinds of politics and policies that would look after them. I've travelled quite a lot in the last few years and um, that means I've amassed a collection of tourist guidebooks, you know, the kind you buy when you're going on holiday somewhere. And they usually got a little section in them on um, travelling as a family. So I, I picked some up and had a look. If you were to go to Mexico and you get your Mexican guidebook, it says Mexicans are very family oriented. Expect a lot of warm attention to your children. If you go a bit further south, if you're going to go to Chile, it says, different book. <laughs> Chileans are very family oriented. Children are popular. In China, children are indulged and pampered. If you go to Italy, it says Italians love children. Do you know what it says in a guide to Britain? <laughs> and this is true. It actually says Britain is not the easiest or most welcoming place for children. I mean, just let that sink in. It's not great, is it? And if we look at the international comparative statistics, and many of you here have heard me talk about these before, we don't do so well on those either. When UNICEF first put out its comparisons of child well-being in rich countries, we came bottom. I think the Netherlands came top <laughs> in that one <laughs> um, on, on many different, different statistics. We now, where are my numbers? We now come 29th for the mental well-being of our children, 19th for their physical well-being and 26th for skills. This is out of rich countries we come 31st for poverty. You're really feeling sorry for us now, aren't you? Yes, yeah. Um, that's bad. And it's, it's not just a recent problem. It's a very long-standing problem. We used to do quite well compared to other countries on measures such as our infant mortality rate. In 1960, we came sixth. And then we just, decade by decade by dec decade, dropped down the rankings. We're now 21st. And across the developed world, we've seen health improve for decade after decade after decade. It stopped. It stopped in this country. And we have seen our infant mortality rates rise over the past decade. That started for our poorest and most deprived families, but now it's overall, just as we've seen our life expectancy grind to a halt, and that started with elderly women, but now it's, it's true for everyone. So this long sort of history of us not addressing the problems that actually matter to all of us in this room very, very much, our careers are engaged with improving the health of the public, looking after children and families, but we're trying to do it in an extremely <laughs> difficult context. We've heard quite a bit about the Marmot, reviewing the Marmot approach today. And Anne, I think, mentioned that the number one recommendation 
in the Marmot Review from 2010 was give every child the best start in life. That was the number one recommendation of the Black Report. That was published in 1980. At the time the Black Report was published, there were twice as many deaths. Um, the death rate was twice as high for infants in the bottom social class compared to the top one in Britain. And when Michael Marmot published the Marmot Review in 2010, guess what? There were twice as many deaths in the bottom social class as compared to the top social class. So that health inequality hadn't shifted. And now it's actually even getting wider. I work a lot looking at children in the north of England compared to the south and we know about the intractable differences we've got in the north compared to the south. I've worked with various local authorities across the north, notably with Greater Manchester and with Bradford, and I see such huge good work going on in those places from public health teams, but, you know, across local authorities, I see people who really care, people who are working hard to develop the best strategies they can, the best partnerships they can, and they simply don't have enough money. They simply can't put in place the services that we need. So in this context, we need initiatives like the first thousand days, absolutely desperately. And we need that philanthrop philanthropic investment that is going to allow you all to make a difference for some families' lives here in Leeds. But we do need so much more than that. Who won't come to your groups? Who won't you be able to reach? And can you find ways to reach them better? Who will come but not respond? Will you evaluate rigorously to find out who does and who doesn't? We've heard a lot about co-production today as well. And that's exciting and it's great that you're going to co-produce with the families you work with priorities perhaps or the areas in which you choose to focus the services you provide to them and the ways you work with them. But I think we need to work with families to co-produce advocacy as well and to co-produce campaigns. I have colleagues at York who ran a project through um, the COVID years called COVID Realities, working with families on low incomes. And now they've continued to do that work and their program's called Changing Realities. They co-produce the research questions that they're interested in, but they also work really hard with the families they work with to enable them to be voices for themselves, to empower them to be able to engage with the media, with politics, with policy makers, so that they can be voices advocating, campaigning for their own change. We need to look at other countries and see what best practice we can pull in terms of politics as well as in terms of policies and services. So it's fantastic that we're looking across to the Netherlands and pulling in a programme that works really well there. We all know that we've tried to pull programmes from elsewhere before. Family Nurse Partnership, anybody? which didn't work in the UK. Contexts are different, but we also need to look and pull policies as well as services. Look at what Scotland are doing to provide extra money to families with children. Look at what Wales is doing, enacting the future generations legislation. And we need to work as an academy as a partnership and as a network of stakeholders and with our families advocating for all of the things that in the future might mean we don't need 
these <coughs> services to the same extent. We don't need to provide because livelihoods will be good enough. Mental health services will be good enough. Inequality will be reduced. Child poverty will be a historical horror. And then we won't have to provide these mitigating services and this sort of impact. Can we afford it? Of course we can. Never think that society cannot afford to do what it prioritises. We are the fifth or the sixth or the seventh, depending on which newspaper or source you read, fifth, sixth or seventh largest economy in the world. If we want to pay for children's well-being, we can do so. It might mean shifting money from one place to another. It might mean taxing differently. It might mean thinking outside the box. But if we put children first, we can afford it. The other day, I was asked by the Equality Trust if I could help them revise and update their estimates of what inequality costs the UK. Um, and I had a spare day, so I was really happy to help. I also really loved doing some number crunching again for the first time in a while. And what we did was we looked at how much the UK would save if its levels of mental illness and its life expectancy and its homicide rates and its imprisonment rates were all improved by reducing its inequality. Not to some perfect state, but just making it as, as equal as the average of the five most equal OECD countries. And we made really conservative estimates. So this is a, this is a minimum number. We would save over £100 billion a year. And that's just on four of the outcomes that are created by our extremely high levels of inequality. So imagine what we'd actually save. Now, if I gave each of you a hundred billion pounds a year, I bet you could come up with some really good ways to spend it to ensure the health and well-being of families and children. So I think we all need to actually dedicate ourselves to trying to unlock that hundred billion pounds. And we do that by advocating for fighting inequality, fighting poverty, and trying to make sure that we do create a society fit for children and a society that puts children first. It's embarrassing to be the worst in, in the world at things, isn't it? It's embarrassing that we're a country where everyone says it's not very nice to be a child. It's embarrassing to come bottom of the statistics. I want to look at a graph and feel like you. I want to see the UK at the top and not at the top for inequality and not at the top for child poverty. I want to see us at the top for the well-being of our children and families. And I know that you are all an extremely dedicated group of people and if you work together I believe you can make it happen in this city in the north and let's do it for the rest of the country as well okay thanks